Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Mary Caldor, uh, and I'm co-director of the Centre of LSE Global Governance. Um, and this is a really nice occasion that we've got today. Uh, it's to discuss this new, um, and to try to mobilise people around it, the new campaign to get rid of nuclear weapons in the world. Global Zero, it's called, and we've got quite a range of people. And the way we're going to do it is in a rather informal way. We're going to have a conversation among us. So our three speakers probably don't need very much um, introduction, but I will introduce them. We're going to start with Dr. Kate Hudson who's the chair of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, which is uh, one of the oldest peace <laughs> movements in Britain and has been campaigning against British nuclear weapons. And she's also an academic. Um, she teaches at South Bank University. She writes about communism, about Yugoslavia, about CND. Uh, and then we have Ambassador Richard Burt, uh, who I remember well from the days of the Reagan administration when I was a peace activist and he was working very hard uh, in the Reagan administration on Reagan's nuclear policy. He then... <laughs> <laughs> we, we just, we're not going to discuss all that. but we. Um, Why not? Well, maybe we can. <laughs> Uh, we're now on the same platform, and he, of course, led the start negotiations, which were tremendously important in taking a big step towards nuclear disarmament, and he's a very important signatory of Global Zero, and he's going to talk to us about how we go about reaching this. And finally, we are very, very happy to have here Queen Noor, Her Majesty Queen Noor, and um, she's... I think many people will know of her work in the Middle East and in the world as a whole. She's always been supporting a whole range of peace activism, uh, women's activism, um, also dialogue between the West and the Muslim world and greater mutual understanding. So I think it's wonderful that she's taken this project on board. So I'm going to start by asking Kate the first question, and I'm going to ask her, what do you think are the contemporary dangers of nuclear weapons? Well, uh, thanks very much, Mary, and may I say it's a great pleasure to be here this evening for an extremely important discussion. I think at the moment the world is faced really with both great opportunities for nuclear disarmament, but also great dangers as well associated with nuclear weapons. I think that you may have read recently in the press there have been many opinion polls over the last few months which show the majority of opinion in Britain is now opposed to nuclear weapons. A majority would welcome the scrapping of Trident. And I think that is because there is an increasing awareness and understanding of the problems that nuclear weapons present and the very great dangers um, that we um, are presented by them. Often if you listen to the news or you read the newspapers, you might be forgiven for thinking that nuclear dangers really stem from rogue states. There are a few problem countries out there who are determined to get nuclear weapons. They must be stopped and that's the beginning of the end and the end of it. But I think that that is a, a misestimate of the situation. The situation is actually much more grave than that and much more nuanced. <laughs> And I will identify in particular three great dangers in regard to nuclear weapons. The first, which I think is the most overwhelming problem, is the fact that we have tens of thousands of nuclear weapons in the world. They are owned by a very small number of nuclear weapon states, more or less eight. Those countries continue by and large to upgrade and further develop and enhance their nuclear weapons, many of which are hundreds of times the power of the bomb which devastated Hiroshima. Many of those countries have nuclear first use policies, and in this I also include NATO, which has a nuclear first use policy. 
and some of those countries would indeed be prepared to use those nuclear weapons against countries which don't have them. So that is a serious problem, and that is the problem that we are all, or many of us here, I hope, perhaps all of us, uh, are determined to address how to deal with that problem. The second issue, of course, is the one that we're perhaps familiar with, this danger that there are some countries who currently don't have them who would like to get them. Perhaps they are determined to proliferate and get nuclear weapons themselves. That is also a danger that we are faced with. There are many countries, or perhaps a number of countries, who feel that they are under threat. They hear powerful countries in the world saying, we need nuclear weapons for our security. So they jump to the same conclusion themselves and decide they wish to get nuclear weapons. A very clear example of that, of course, you're probably familiar with, is the case of North Korea, which used to be a signatory to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation <coughs> Treaty, decided to withdraw uh, earlier in this decade, saying they felt they had a deterrent need for nuclear weapons. Perhaps that was because they were on the so-called nuclear hit list of the Bush administration. So those types of issues can lead to a desire by countries to proliferate. They feel that they have a, what they would consider to be a deterrent need for nuclear weapons. I believe, CND believes, that the failure of the nuclear weapon states to disarm, as they committed to under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty three decades or so ago, uh, the failure of those states to disarm is leading to proliferation. That is the problem. And those two issues, the failure to disarm and the danger of proliferation, are inextricably linked. And that is increasingly widely recognised internationally, not just by campaigning organisations, but by top people across the political sphere, diplomatic spheres, and so on. And then thirdly, the other danger is the danger that non-state actors may acquire nuclear weapons or rudimentary nuclear materials which could create a dirty bomb or something of that sort. People have often said terrorists can't be deterred by the threat of nuclear weapons. That would seem sensible. This is a whole new issue. What does one do about the danger of loose nukes and non-state actors? We would argue that the only way to deal with that particular problem is to abolish nuclear weapons and to remove the danger of nuclear weaponry and nuclear materials getting into any hands. We wouldn't say the wrong hands. We would say all hands are wrong for nuclear weapons. So we believe that abolition is the only way forward. We're delighted that that recognition is increasingly embraced internationally. Our own Prime Minister Gordon Brown has recognised explicitly, along with many of his ministers, that there is a relationship between the failure to disarm and the tendency to proliferate. He was a, a change. Mr. Mr Blair before him did not share that view. Mr Brown has taken that position. President Obama has that type of view. Many world leaders now share that view. So what is essential is that, as well as that understanding, we need a combination of political will and political action to make that vision of a nuclear-free world a reality. And I believe that it's down to all of us as well. Civil society must find its voice and must find its role in making that happen, because only a world free of nuclear weapons can be a safe world for all of us. Thank you. Thank Thank you very much, Kate. And I think it's great that actually Global Zero have brought together Kate Hudson and Ambassador Burt on the same platform. And so I'd love to ask him how he thinks we get to that place that Kate is proposing. I thought you were going to ask me, is how did you get up here? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing here? No, I'm delighted that you're here. So I'm Perfect. asking you, how do you think we get to the next stage? Because after all, you've been involved in all of this for a very long time, deeply involved. How are we going to actually make that jump now that we've got quite a global consensus? Well, what I think I'd like to talk about is, is really uh, 
two issues as a way of, of setting the framework for what I hope will be an interactive discussion later on. And uh, I should say, I guess, by way of introduction, I have spent a good deal of my life thinking uh, about nuclear weapons, uh, first as, a, as an academic, actually just down the road where I spent four years at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, and, and uh, then writing about them when I was a New York Times correspondent, and, and then in government. Uh, finally, I came to my senses, and recent years have been trying to make money, but we won't talk about that tonight. <laughs> but, uh, the real, I think the really interesting thing about this debate now, the new interest, uh, heightened interest in thinking about global zero or nuclear elimination is that uh, the people who are talking about it are not necessarily or just or just the same old crowd. They're not uh, the Mary Caldors or the Kate Hudsons. Uh, and we need them. They have been pursuing the, the uh, a kind of activist disarmament agenda for many years. But now they've been reinforced, and reinforced by people uh, like me who recognize that the world has fundamentally changed from the Cold War period. And if you look at the uh, signatories to this global zero concept, and uh, Queen Noor was present uh, in Paris in uh, last February when we brought together 200 people to, uh, to discuss this, and, in, in initiating the Global Zero effort. Uh, we had, uh, I think, senior people from every uh, American administration sent, uh, going back to Richard Nixon. We had Republicans, we had Democrats, we had former secretaries of defense, former secretaries of state, former national security advisors, people who had basically ha had careers in the national security space and who had supported in one form or another uh, uh, NATO and Western uh, deterrence policy all through the Cold War period. In fact, one of our uh, leading uh, one of our leading spokesmen here is Malcolm Rivka, a former Conservative Party Minister of Defense. So why why are these people suddenly supporting uh, this this objective? I think there's a recognition that the world has shifted, that nuclear weapons. Uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the late 20th century uh, were great power weapons and they contributed in a bipolar international system uh, to a certain stability in the relationship. That, uh, that uh, the nuclear standoff between the United States and the Soviet Union uh, made the initiation of conflict uh, unthinkable. Now you can disagree with that classic deterrence approach, but there was a great deal of support for it, uh, not only uh, in the United States, but on this side uh, of, of the Atlantic. Uh, what people recognize is that in the 21st century, uh, nuclear deterrence begins to look pretty dangerous when you're talking about potentially in 10, 20 years from now, as Kate Hudson was discussing, a world of maybe 20 or 30 nuclear powers. Or countries uh, that possess nuclear arsenals that are on the verge of becoming a failed state. I'm not sure if nuclear deterrence allows me to sleep at night when I think about the Talibanization of Pakistan, for example a country that has a nuclear arsenal. And I worry about where those nuclear weapons might end up in the, con in the context of a major, uh, of, a major uh, 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 of a major insurrection and insurgency in Pakistan. Now I'm not predicting that and I'm not trying to pick on Pakistan in particular, but I'm saying when you look at the possibility of Iran going nuclear, and the, and the cascade effect of Iran's nuclearization leading to Saudi Arabia acquiring nuclear weapons, Turkey potentially acquiring nuclear weapons, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and other states in the region. 
uh, nuclear deterrence doesn't seem to make sense in, in, in a world that is, where power is much more decentralized and where, uh, where nuclear weapons are much more obtainable. We're talking about technology that is more than 50 years old, where a lot of it is available, the intellectual property is available on the internet, and where if you can uh, get the resources or steal the resources, you can build a nuclear weapon. And you see what uh, the North Koreans, for example, have been able to achieve. So what's changed is the distribution of power in the international system, the end of the Cold War, and the growing ability of, of, of weaker countries, even, and I'll use the term rogue states, and sub-state actors, groups like Al-Qaeda, to potentially uh, acquire these weapons. It's not a choice, it seems to me, between sort of standing still where we are with a world of eight or nine nuclear powers and, uh, and, and, trying, to, uh, and trying to eliminate nuclear weapons. The choice is a world with 20, 25, 30 nuclear powers and trying to eliminate these weapons. And I think that's one reason why a number of people, not only from the center left, but from the center right, are seriously interested in this, uh, in this option. The second question that's uh, worth asking is, how do we get there? Is this re a realizable goal? Well, the big obstacles in the past were, of course, uh, one of the principal obstacles, and it's been alluded to here, was what was uh, U.S. And, and NATO policy because of the reliance of the West on nuclear weapons. There was a belief in the 1950s and into the 1960s and beyond, rightly or wrongly, that we were outgunned in terms of conventional capabilities vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact allies. And the only way we could compensate for that conventional weakness was by relying on the threat of nuclear escalation. What's interesting now, if you look at, uh, if you look at, uh, at military forces in the world today, is that, convention, we, that we are no longer conventionally weak. And that, uh, and that uh, any possible threat that we would face from a, from a, from a, a third state uh, is, is not capable of matching Western, NATO, or U.S. capabilities. The United States is now conventionally the preeminent power in the world. You may not like that, but the point I'm making is, it, is that the, the reliance on nuclear weapons is no longer necessary. So the United States, as I think, as Barack Obama has made very clear, is, is very open-minded and, and, and supportive of the notion of a world without nuclear weapons. That's an important step forward. Russia, uh, April 1st here in London, Dmitry Medvedev agreed with Barack Obama that the total of elimination of nuclear weapons was uh, a constructive goal. Uh, that's the first time that a Russian and American leader have made that statement. So uh, we've made real headway with the Russians. There is a potential obstacle here, and it begins to look like a line of dominoes, because for the Russians to be able to embrace global zero, they'll not only want the United States to want to go down to zero, but they're going to worry about China. So that means that we need to bring the Chinese into this equation. Now, the United States and Russia both possess roughly 10,000 nuclear weapons apiece. That's 95 to 96 percent of the world's nuclear stockpile. Chinese only, they have a strategy of minimum deterrence. They only have a few hundred. So in order to bring the Chinese into this process, the United States and Russia are going to have to go far further than they have to date. It's not going to be enough to get this new START treaty that they're currently negotiating. They're going to have to go back to the negotiating table, in my view, and negotiate deeper cuts down to maybe 1,000 weapons apiece. If we can do that, I believe we can bring the Chinese in. That is a critical step. If we can bring China to the negotiating table, then the Indians will come. Because the Indians won't come unless the Chinese are there. 
If we bring the Indians, we have an opportunity then of dealing with the Pakistanis. So I think there is a political roadmap you can put together over the next two or three years that will multilateralize the U.S.-Russia bilateral arms control dialogue and bring all the nuclear weapons states to the table. And I might add, if we're going to succeed in this process, it means all the nuclear powers, not just the acknowledged nuclear powers, and that means Israel as well at some point. I'll just conclude by saying we may not get there. There are some very difficult and challenging intellectual problems of getting down to zero. One is verification and compliance. How do we know one or more countries isn't going to try to hide a few weapons to brandish in a world where none are supposed to exist? There's the issue of, of enforcement because I don't think anybody's going to sign up to the long-term goal of zero unless you have an enforcement mechanism and who's going to Who's going to exercise that enforcement mechanism? The United Nations? UN Security Council? How's that going to work? I don't think those problems are insoluble, and the good news here is we don't have to get there right away. We have to work these problems out if you're going to be realistic over the next 10 or 20 years. But they do need a good deal of work. We've got some momentum now. I think there's a, there's a clear pathway of how to get to zero. We have an American president who uh, strongly believes in this goal. We have a Russian president who has endorsed it. So what's stopping us? Well, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> and so now, finally, is what's stopping us that there isn't enough public pressure? Is that one of the questions that's stopping us? And if so, is there a way we can mobilize public pressure? So this is my question to Her Majesty. Well, that is certainly one of the, um, one of the objectives of, of, of Global Zero and perhaps one of the ways that, that um, it, it is distinguished to some extent um, from, from what has preceded it, though um, that there have been quite a few initiatives um, over time, and there have been um, leading figures, including in the United States, uh, since President Truman, and the scientists who first developed the technology who have called for the total elimination of nuclear weapons, and in fact, for all the component parts of what our Global Zero plan is since the 1940s. And it was Oppenheimer who described the hydrogen bomb as a weapon of genocide. So there has been, over all these years, a recognition, um, even before the proliferation that we see today, that, that we might well reach, which is what many members of Global Zero believe, is a, that we are very close to a nuclear tipping point, uh, to a point beyond which it might be very difficult to rein in this, um, this monster that um, has, has been um, loose in, in, in the world uh, for so long now. Um, I, I, just to build on a few points that you made that are relevant to the question, um, Global Zero actually has conducted a poll, and the results of the poll were that on average 76% of people around the world in nuclear and non-nuclear states believe uh, you know, support the elimination of, of nuclear weapons. And that includes countries as diverse as, as Israel, countries in Europe, um, Arab countries, and, Even and, France. and others. <laughs> France is one of, our, one of the areas where we need to mobilize um, support. Um, and um, I am here in part because I'm hoping we will have a broad interaction today um, hoping that we can hear a little bit from you what you think are ways in which we might mobilize not only student communities around the world, but, but, but others around the world in, in the communities that, that you are familiar with. There is this new bipartisan momentum in the, in the United States, and there is this consensus that has been referred to briefly that, that has been building about based on the th very real threats that have already been de um, described here. And there is a recognition that civil society, as Kate said, has a very important role to play. And I would include 
all of you and, and your um, uh, uh, brothers and sisters around the world in, in, in that component part of, um, of the, um, the effort that we all need to make together. Uh, Global Zero is, uh, is focusing on um, high-level policy work and uh, working with governments and is represented, as you heard, by uh, many figures um, uh, who were, in fact, the architects of their country's nuclear programs um, who bring the scientific, political, military expertise to the process. Our next meeting in Paris in, in February of next year will include young people, will include a broader cross-section of, of um, populations uh, around the world that we are very much hoping um, to mobilize to um, engage um, w with uh, Global Zero and, and to, um, um, to engage members of their own communities and uh, work to um, influence the, both the public sector and other national institutions to, to, um, to join this, this effort. Um, we have a public campaign underway that involves face-to-face -face, uh, meetings like this, media, online advocacy as well, um, online educational tools um, available. We're um, through uh, some of our partners such as Twitter, Facebook, um, and, and others, and we're developing student chapters. Uh, we began this summer in the United States and 17 states around the uh, United States now. There are student chapters. We're hoping to expand to the UK, to France, to Russia, to Germany, um, to, to broaden that student movement, to, to make it global. And we are training uh, leaders, student leaders, in, in, in um, the, the, the different ways in which they can lead um, activist movements in their um, schools and in, in their communities. We will actually have a leadership session at our Paris summit over five days. So we're focusing on, on new chapters in um, China, India, Pakistan, J Japan, and Germany, as well as the UK and, um, and, and Russia. We have on our uh, Global Zero website a, um, an area of how you can get involved. So I'm speaking now directly to all of you. You've heard a great deal of information, which Global Zero is trying to disseminate in, alongside so many other organizations that have been working on this issue for so long. And we need uh, a multi-generational, multi-sectoral approach to this if we're going to succeed. Uh, there, there has been a great deal of progress. There are 183 countries that have signed on to um, the, um, uh, you know, who, who have um, um, for, forsworn the use of, of nuclear weapons. There are eight nuclear weapons free zones in the world. Um, and there have been some very successful cases of the denuclearization of states um, that, uh, that, that were nuclear. Um, it is uh, um, uh, probably almost impossible today as well to develop a nuclear weapons program without um, uh, detection. Um, it, it, it is uh, one of the challenges we face, but it is um, uh, the, the technology uh, is available today so that many of the threats and concerns that were valid in the past are less um, uh, uh, less serious, um, perhaps, than before. And then to add another um, more positive uh, slant on perhaps China, President Hu called for the elimination of nuclear weapons. Um, they have had, actually they were the first country to call for the elimination of nuclear weapons in, I think it was 1963, but he reiterated that very recently around the time of the uh, UN Security Council meeting, the first ever um, to cover this subject uh, chaired by President Obama very recently. And they have this policy that is, is in fact more enlightened than the Russian and the American, no first use. They're against, uh, they will not uh, use weapons against non-nuclear states. Their weapons are not on hair trigger alert. They are de-alerted de completely. Um, and their president has called for, um, uh, you know, as President Medvedev and President uh, Obama. As uh, Ambassador Burt said, uh, their position is the U.S. and Russia and its Global Zero's position must make deep cuts 
um, in order for China and for an entire multilateral process, we believe, to, to engage the other nuclear states and to make real progress. Um, we, I, what I believe is, is very important that I believe you can help us with and why global uh, popular support and activism is so important um, is that this has to be a, uh, and I think that's something that is, has been clear from what has been said earlier, this is a process that needs to be um, a consistent, balanced, uh, universal, if you will, uh, no uh, double standards, no exceptions to the process. And that is very much what Global Zero's um, position is. And the commission, which um, Ambassador Burt, I think, uh, alluded to, of 23 top political and military personnel that have provided uh, the, the outlines of, of a, um, actually fleshed out to some extent, the, the um, outlines of a way that Global Zero could be achieved over a 20-year period. In other words, this is not, we're very realistic, we know this is a long, complex, dynamic political process. At the same time, we have actually laid out, and we'll present in Paris, or the Commission has, a step-by-step -step phased uh, plan for a verifiable enforcement of a process leading to the elimination of, of nuclear weapons. So there is a great deal to, um, to work with. And our website, globalzero.org, um, offers the opportunity to join with those who have signed a declaration, Global Zero Declaration. In fact, in three days prior to the July um, Obama Medvedev uh, summit, 100,000 people signed the Global Zero Declaration. This is um, uh, something that, that, um, th that I would urge you to go to the site to, to read it, uh, to encourage others to read it, not just your fellow students here, but, but others in your families and communities, and um, to consider ways in which you might uh, join us. And also, this evening, I hope, as I said, we'll have the opportunity to perhaps listen. If you ask some questions, perhaps also we'll have a chance to hear some of your thoughts on how we might more effectively reach out to um, a broader spectrum of populations in um, uh, the world over. Thank you very much for coming this evening and, and for being um, um, engaged with us uh, to the extent that you are. Um, we look forward to working together in the future. Well, thank you so much for that. And before we open the floor, maybe we should have a little discussion among ourselves. And I'll just try to keep the discussion going by um, asking people questions. So my first question, obviously, is to Kate. Kate, do you think this program that's been laid out, both by Ambassador Burt and Queen Noor, is achievable? Is it the way to go? After all, CND's always been in favor of unilateral disarmament. Do you think it needs to go in a different way? And also, I mean, to add to that, we hear this, we, I mean, I'm strongly in favor of this program and I really hope we achieve it, but my question is, actually, it's much more difficult at the moment to mobilize people behind this, maybe because they think governments are going to do it, than it is on, say, climate change. And what's been your experience in CND in mobilizing people in recent years? It's very different from the atmosphere during the Cold War when people were really worried, um, even though the risks are probably much greater today? Well, um, I absolutely think the goal is achievable. I think it's been presented in a very realistic fashion. Obviously, I would like it to happen immediately, but as that <laughs> may not be possible, a step-by-step -step process of achievable goals, bringing everyone on board, seems like a very good solution to me. 
I don't think it's a utopian fantasy. I think we only have to look at other successful examples of legislation and conventions which are outlawing and eliminating <coughs> other forms of weapons of mass destruction. For example, the chemical and biological weapons conventions, the landmines ban. Those things have been achieved gradually over time, ensuring buy-in from states. So I think there are examples there of how that is achievable, and again, I come back to the issue of political will. It is something that can be done, and there are proper procedures in place to make that possible. You mentioned the unilateral, multilateral issue. I'm sure as a historian as well, you'll know that in its origins, the CND has always been both for unilateral disarmament of Britain and for multilateral disarmament as well. We're not a NIMBY organisation, and much as we would like Britain to get rid of its nuclear weapons now, and we will continue to press for that, that is only a very tiny drop in the ocean of the global arsenals, and it would not be the solution solely for Britain to disarm. We need full multilateral universal nuclear disarmament, and we are fully on board for that. In terms of mobilising, um, this is an interesting question. My first involvement with CND and the peace movement was in the early 1980s. I, like many of my fellows at that time, genuinely feared that I was going to die in a nuclear holocaust. That was a, the fear was a very great mobilising factor at that time, and CND grew massively and very rapidly. Um, but I think that there is a very great awareness there today of the nuclear problem. People may not march on the streets necessarily in that same kind of way that they did in the 1980s, but we have many people from all walks of life across society engaging in the political process, engaging with the media, engaging with their MPs, going to bases, taking part in non-violent direct action. There are many different ways in which people can be engaged. Marching, which is a, an easily identifiable and quantifiable <laughs> method, is only one. So I think that is great participation out there, but at the moment it's still not quite enough and we need to build it even wider. Thank you. Well now what I would like to ask uh, Ambassador Bert is, is really two questions. One is uh, really a sort of in a way almost a philosophical question which is it has always seemed to me that nuclear weapons are very much associated with great power status. There's an idea that to be a big power, you have to have nuclear weapons. And how is one going to be able to change that mindset? That's my first question. And my second question relates to a very specific point you made. You said one of the things that's made things different is that the US is now conventionally superior, so it doesn't need nuclear weapons, and that makes everything else possible. But why shouldn't other countries feel that way, unless you change the mindset? I mean, if, if you know, maybe that's exactly what China thinks, for example. And so how does one get away from thinking in that way? Yeah. Uh, my answer is it's happening. And you saw it in a very, very candid, or in sharp relief this week with uh, Barack Obama in China. I mean, as I said before, China only has about 300 nuclear weapons. And when people talk about the rise of China, which is clearly a major, a major historical importance, I mean, we're, we are seeing a fundamental reordering of the international system, which I, I think, you know, which has been in, in place since, uh, since the end of World War II. Uh, uh, and that, that has nothing to do with Chinese nuclear weapons. Uh, it largely has to do with China's economic capacity and the fact that, uh, that it holds so much U.S. debt. We are, we are moving, uh, again, when I talk about a 20th uh, century model to a 21st century model, we're moving from, in my view, a, a, a geopolitics that was based on political military power to a geopolitics based on political economic power. Now, there, you can go out and people can protest globalization and say we don't like it this way, but that, that's the way it is. 
And, uh, and uh, it was just striking for me to see the kind of deference that, uh, that Barack Obama gave uh, Hu Jintao because, of, uh, because there's a reordering of international, of international power and the international system. So we've got two different related processes. One is the redistribution of power. And two, what counts for power? And when I think about nuclear weapons, for most states, most of this existing group of states, nuclear weapons are irrelevant. Even my old adversary, Richard Pearl, has been quoted as saying, Russians and the United States are, are not going to ever use nuclear weapons against each other. And it's true. I, mean, I can't imagine a, a situation where today, where Russia and the United States would be launching ICBM attacks on each other. And, uh, and it's, it's just, uh, so I, I think for great powers, nuclear weapons are increasingly irrelevant. Now, there are some special cases that are worth thinking about a little bit. Uh, India, I think, got into the game at the end of that great power process. They finally decided that they wanted to be seen as a great power, and as part of that process, they needed nuclear weapons. I think my own view personally is I think Indian strategists uh, regret that, and some in private will tell you that, because it was just an open invitation for the Pakistanis then to acquire their nuclear forces. Uh, but I don't think that India has any intention of, of, of using, uh, using nuclear weapons. I think they saw it as kind of a necessary step to kind of their emergence as, as a great power. But I don't think anybody thinks of India, and increasingly they're not going to be thinking of India as a great power because of its nuclear arsenal. It's going to be, again, the same case of China. It's going to be based around their emergence as, as a high-performing, big economy. And, and, and especially their technical capabilities, not in building nuclear weapons, but in IT, in Bangalore. So, uh, I think that, that we, we have to recognize that these changes are, are occurring and that they, the, that's the, the, maybe the positive side of, of this equation. The negative side of the equation is that, uh, is that, is that uh, people with, uh, people with, uh, with reckless ambitions, people with uh, irrational uh, 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 governments or leaderships, people with, uh, with goals that are based around uh, destroying uh, uh, other countries or other tribes or other ethnic groups or other cultures or other religions are going to find it easier to acquire nuclear weapons. And I, I conclude my answers. I agree with maybe it was uh, uh, Kate or, or Queen Noor, who said that we're at a kind of tipping point here, I, I think we have to recognize that we are. I, I can see one alternative future here where we can achieve global zero. There is an opportunity that is unprecedented for us to get to zero. We are also, though, in a situation where if, uh, if we don't grab this uh, opportunity very, very quickly and get, get a legitimate and credible process going where people understand that we're moving this ahead, that we will see, uh, we will see a, a surge in proliferation. And then, uh, and then it won't be stoppable. It, that may happen, by the way. That may happen with j just Iranians, uh, Iranian acquisition of nuclear weapons. And I should be clear on this. I'm not sure the Iranians, in my view, have made that decision yet. But if they do acquire nuclear weapons, if and when they acquire nuclear weapons, we may have lost the chance for Global Zero because it could trigger regional arms, nuclear arms races that will be very difficult to rein in. Well, thank you very much for that answer. And a final question to Queen Noor, particularly sort of starting with the last point. Um, as uh, you've lived most of your life in the Middle East, and do you think it's going to be more difficult given Israeli nuclear weapons and given the way 
Iranian public somehow feels this is a way of standing up to the United States to mobilize people around this goal? I, I think that another area of emphasis, again, of Global Zero is the recognition that we have to look at regional insecurities and, and, and the various um, drivers of proliferation, some of which have, have, have already been um, referred to. Um, and I would also add a, another point that, that um, while great powers um, may, may be reassessing and, and, and rethinking as, uh, in light of current realities, there, there is still a very, um, uh, the Middle East, for example, is, is, is one of the prime markets for weapons technologies. Um, and so that hasn't deterred or slowed the selling of uh, technologies um, to weapons technologies to our region. In fact, global uh, military spending is about 10 times what is spent on humanitarian needs. And in the Middle East, we have the highest per capita spending on arms anywhere in the world. By 2014, it may be up to 100 billion a year. Um, because we are seen as a great market. So, uh, and this is in a region where poverty is on average 40%, illiteracy 40%. Um, we have uh, perhaps 100 million Arab youth will be unemployed by 2015. Um, refugees, uh, enormous refugee flows um, in, our, in our region. And now, and while there has been a regional arms race so that accounts for that uh, highest per capita spending on arms, it's now um, potentially a nuclear arms race, or to some extent it has been for, for, for a while, at, at least um, in, um, in, in, in terms of perceptions. At least 13 countries in 2006 announced their plans um, to begin or to revive nuclear, civilian nuclear energy projects. Um, many of these countries with absolutely no need whatsoever to initiate at that moment in time uh, uh, civilian nuclear energy projects. But um, this was seen as a, 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 an indicator of the cascade effect that Ambassador Burt referred to earlier in terms of the Iranian nuclear program. On the other hand, if you look at the um, deterrent uh, the, the philosophy, how did you put it, of the deterrent mindset in any case that has driven um, the, the um, weapons programs, mm -hmm. for example, Pakistan is one example in response to the Indian program. Um, and you look at North Korea and the most recent um, Bush administration um, approach to different countries, uh, different, uh, rogue nations in, in terms of the NPT or, or um, in terms of uh, nuclear arms uh, programs, uh, it was rather selective. And it's, they, they ended up targeting the one country that didn't have nuclear weapons of the axis of evil, um, or the one country that, that, <coughs> uh, um, you know, that, that, that didn't appear to have uh, uh, produced a threat yet, whereas there did appear to many to be deterrent value to the program in, in, in North Korea. And the Iranians are certainly looking, no doubt, at the deterrent value, in other words, a 20th century concept that these weapons might provide when they have been targeted very, in a very confrontational, very aggressive way, and when they've made overtures at different times after 9-11, 2003, to the United States to actually work with them to combat terrorism, to, to try to manage al-Qaeda, to, to, on, on a, a number of different feelers were sent out that, that were rebuffed. Um, it, it, none of us will ever know what those might have led to because they, they were non-starters as far as the Bush administration was concerned. So I would, I would say from my time living in the region, which is what you're asking about, um, that confrontational um, approaches, uh, disrespectful, if you will, approaches, whether or not the, the policies of a, a given country are actually respectable, um, double standards where there is a great deal of detention focused on the Iranian program, zero discussion in the United States um, on, on the Israeli um, already um, 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 
fairly clear um, n n uh, nuclear arsenal that its own um, that those um, working with it have, have actually acknowledged and, and described to some extent. Ambassador Burt is one of the few American public figures that actually I've heard mention that in a conversation. And it's not uh, to take sides. It's because if you don't look at all sides of this um, puzzle, if you don't um, uh, apply consistent standards across the board, that, that you will never succeed. And um, in our region in particular, um, the, the, the Iran, I think one of the best ways to tackle uh, the, the, the possible um, threat um, from Iran, even though two of its leaders, Ayatollah Khomeini in 1979 and Ayatollah Khamenei last year, both reiterated the Islamic injunction against the killing of innocent civilians. It is forbidden in Islam. And these leading religious figures made a point of, 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 um, of expressing that. So um, I'm not to, that's not to say that there aren't other elements and there aren't other uh, factors at play where Iran is concerned. But let us look at a state like Iran and look at the ways in which you can begin to um, diminish the, the, those factors that are driving a program um, that is generated by insecurity or by the need for prestige or to distract people from other domestic problems, one way would be to bring Israel into uh, the equation of states in the Middle East that have signed onto the NPT. It has not. Um, find a way to address their legitimate security concerns, but at the same time, there the same pressure should be brought to bear on every single nuclear state to sign to and adhere to the requirements of the NPT. There, there, there can be no exceptions, or there will always be um, um, exceptions um, in, in terms of, um, um, or, or there will always be violations, if, if you will. Um, we have on, on our, um, on the Global Zero, um, um, in our, um, group of founding leaders, we have um, an Israeli observer, we have uh, Pakistanis and Indians, and, and uh, as, as was already stated, leaders from European countries and other nuclear states. Um, I'm hoping very much at our meeting in Paris that we'll have someone from Iran. And we have several Arab members of our founding leaders as well, um, Ambassador Lakhdar Brahimi and Amr Musa, who is the um, Secretary of the General League of Arab States. These are two very, very um, Lakhdar uh, uh, Brahimi was a UN special rep to Afghanistan and Iraq and is very highly regarded. And Amr Musa plays a very critical role in the region. So we, we are represented, and um, there is, there, there is a, has been a call since 1974 for a Middle East weapons of mass destruction free zone. It is, there is a consensus agreement that that is in the interests of, of all states in the region. We are just one example of, of the dynamics at play in a variety of different regions in the world. But I think those fundamental principles have to apply, um, that we address the insecurities of individual states and the regional uh, dynamics that have driven pr proliferation. We do it in a constructive and positive and engaging way. And we eliminate the confrontational approach, which only hardens and sets minds against dialogue and against cooperative efforts. Well, thank you very much, because you've raised so many issues. And I'd love to go on being the person who asked the question. But I now want to give the audience a chance. And what I'll do is I'll take you in threes. So I am going, I'm looking around. I can see one, uh, two, three, four, five. I look for the women Sydney first, Sydney. and I know it's Sydney. very discriminatory. So I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I've seen you, but I'm going to allow a man after this one. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Ambassador Richard Byrne. Um, basically, how do you see it happen that um, Israel, as you said at one point, 
uh, will be agreeing on the zero initiative. And then from your view, how do you um, actually see the peace process between uh, Palestine and Israelis? And then the clashes between the fundament fundamentalists influence this progress of negotiation with Israel. Thank you. I mean, you, you, okay. I'm going to take that was addressed to you. <laughs> I'm going to take this this gentleman down here. Yeah, you. <laughs> and then the final one will be this. Thank you very right. much. Um, I have uh, two very brief questions. Firstly, there's uh, next year the NPT Review Summit coming up. I'm just wondering what you think we can expect and hope for from that. And secondly, the rather more difficult question, I think, of uh, what do you think the world can do, uh, especially in terms of the NPT, about states that uh, essentially move towards a nuclear weapons program but stop just short of it, that never actually build the weapons but exist in a state where at any time they would be a very short distance from building the weapons. Great. And then this lady at the front. Thank you. Um, I wonder what the panel think about nuclear deterrence actually making more sense given a decentralized distribution of power where there is more to fear, and also this, um, the state's call for disarmament, do you think they really mean it, um, or is it just like they s it sound good and responsible to be calling for nuclear disarmament? Thank you. So, um, I'll take these three, and then I'll come have another round, and maybe I'll just let you <laughs> choose which questions you want to answer. So I'll start with Rick. Uh, yeah, I'll be I, I, I'll be very I'll be very very quick here. I just a couple of uh, 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 there's some good questions here. I'm certainly not going to address what I think the future of the uh, Israeli Arab peace process. Is. <laughs> Why not? Unless you uh, unless you have brought your sleeping bags. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, but uh, but that uh, but but there obviously is a linkage between getting uh, the Israelis uh, in, into this process and and some headway or some progress. Uh, but uh, but uh, and and th that's a positive linkage. A negative linkage is uh, is if uh, going back again to to the issue problem of Iranian uh, acquisition of nuclear weapons. Uh, that's yet another. Makes it uh, makes it even harder to kind of imagine how the Israelis would come along here. If the Israelis are uh, an unacknowledged nuclear state, uh, it's going to be very hard to have when when this process is multilateralized and everybody's sitting around a round table. Uh, it's very hard to to visualize a, a a sign that says Israel with a little flag, with uh, with a diplomat sitting there, because they they won't acknowledge in a formal way they have nuclear weapons. That said, there are ways that they could participate in that process, sort of one uh, office uh, or one person removed. Uh, and it would, uh, it would be make the negotiation more complicated, uh, for sure. But I think it's be ne it's 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 a it's a necessary prerequisite for making headway here. So uh, I think it's more of a problem of diplomatic choreography on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, it'll be expedited by uh, by by uh, some progress, uh, uh, particularly on settling the uh, the set of uh, very difficult issues involving. Uh, the uh, Israelis and Palestinians. On the, uh, on the issue of the NPT review conference, I mean, I think we all agree here. Well, first of all, the one that took place five years ago was a disaster because all the non-nuclear states just beat up on the nuclear states, and in particular, the United States, in saying that they were not, uh, they were not making good on their Article Six commitments <coughs> under the nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty of 1968. I think that uh, what we need to do here, and we all agree here, is one way you stop the spread of nuclear weapons is to demonstrate to non-nuclear states that the nuclear powers recognize their responsibilities. If, if everybody shows up in June 
and that we have a START treaty negotiated between the United States and Russia, that that treaty has already gone before the U.S. Senate to be ratified, and that finally the United States either has either begun or has set a date for ratification of the CTBT, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, uh, and, uh, and, and the United States and Russia have also agreed to a follow-on set of negotiations and maybe to bring their, both their uh, arsenals uh, down to 1,000 weapons apiece, I think that can create the sort of consensus at that June meeting that just raises the bar for any country to think about acquiring nuclear weapons. Because after all, that's what this is all about, in my view is really making it, creating new political obstacles for anybody anywhere to think about acquiring nuclear weapons. Uh, because they know that they're going to become pariahs. They know that uh, they are going to be isolated uh, in the international community. A final comment on, on the very good question on, on, on what uh, is, is really a, one of those challenging problems I talked about. And there, there are two twists to this problem. One is the, is what, uh, what uh, is really what some people have called the Japanese option. Because as some of you in this room may know, uh, the Japanese, needless to say, is having been the target of uh, the only target in in history of of, of nuclear use, uh, and having a great nuclear allergy, have nevertheless have the capability because they are so dependent on the American nuclear deterrent, the uh, American nuclear guarantee, some people call it the umbrella, that they have the, they, it is widely known they have the ability to constitute their own nuclear weapons very quickly. I won't define how quickly, but they have, and they have the means to deliver those weapons. Uh, obviously we don't want to live in a world where 20 or 30 countries have that capability in a matter of weeks or months to quickly quickly build nuclear weapons and deploy them. So that is part of the challenge of, in, of verification and compliance, <coughs> is to be able to identify those activities, to understand what the red lines are, and to be able to have some sense, some, some sense of how close countries are coming. There's also, though, the other problem of reconstitution, because once you've got nuclear weapons and you've taken them down, you've taken the widgets out of the nuclear weapons and the other parts and gizmos and stuff. You want to make sure that somebody doesn't, you know, somebody doesn't turn around and have the capability then in a very, a couple of maybe days put them back together and have, uh, suddenly have that nuclear capability. And so you don't want <coughs> former nuclear states that are now, quote, non-nuclear, to have this ability to rush forward and deploy these forces in some kind of crisis. So uh, there, the solution will have to be technical in nature, and it, but it will require a degree of, of, of access, of, of, of inspections and verification that goes, uh, goes much further than what, we've, what we were able to negotiate, for example, in the 1990s with the first Star Treaty. Now, I don't know if you two want to add or whether we should actually let them have a, th a second go and then you start next time. If we start next time, can we respond to these questions? <laughs> you, you, you certainly can and you can respond now if you would like. It just occurred to me we could fit more questions. Yes. Let's take more questions and then we can come okay, back great. Like. Now, we've got lots of people. I think that gentleman right at the back was one of the earliest. And then I'll go to the woman on my usual principle. <laughs> Hi there. Um, I understand how Global Zero works when you're talking about states. I understand um, what the state has to gain, what, what the people in the state have to gain. Um, I understand it far less when we talk about non-state players. So you talked, um, uh, Ambassador Burt, about um, rogue groups of people, and you mentioned a couple of terrorist organizations, etc. I mean, at the moment, these, the, the creation of, of, of nuclear weapons to, 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 a, to a large extent is, is difficult for these small groups, but what, it, what is to say that if we go down this route of, of Global Zero, that 
that, that creates even more of a polarization between states that now have no nuclear capabilities and black market groups who are able to acquire capabilities. How do you, how do you reconcile that even greater divide? Okay, and now we have, yeah. I think, have you got a microphone? Yesterday evening at LSE, we heard Ed Miliband talk about the challenges facing the planet, energy security and the, um, the, e the end of the oil supply, and, and especially climate change. Um, it seems to me that the world faces a great energy shortage and that nu nuclear energy is really, really one, we have really have to embrace nuclear energy in the next, in the next few decades. Um, that will mean that nuclear technology will, will disseminate really around the globe to many countries who never had it before. And um, we've seen that there is a lot of reluctance on the part of the West to say, um, allow Iran to enrich their own fuel. Do you think that in the future, possibly, there will have to be some kind of system by which there are central enrichment depots, by which um, smaller states may acquire fuel, while um, allaying the fears of the West that that fuel may be used for um, um, non-peaceful purposes? Very good question. Okay, and then I'll take this gentleman here. Uh, President Obama um, yesterday and today has been speaking about the imposition of sanctions against Iran if they uh, don't agree to continue negotiations in a substantive way. I wanted to ask what your expert opinions are on the effectiveness of such sanctions. Okay, great. So, shall I go to Queen Noor now? Um, a, a couple of, of questions previous and in this, um, in this uh, group. Um, uh, the, the one about states almost uh, just short coming just short of, of uh, weaponizing, if you will, um, their nuclear programs. And the question about nuclear energy uh, raised the, uh, an issue or a subject that, that, um, it, that our commission is looking into, I believe. Um, <laughs> I'm not quite sure how far, uh, in what detail we'll present it. Um, but that has been under discussion really, again, since the beginning of the Cold War, which is the subject of the internationalization of the fuel bank. The, the, and there, there are um, a, a range of different um, proposals that have been put forward. You're probably far more knowledgeable than I am on the, on the range of them. But um, whether there is one international fuel bank or there are regional fuel banks um, to provide um, uh, access to the materials required for for civilian uh, nuclear energy, and it, it is also um, a a, um, a question of, of sovereignty that that um, is constantly um, uh, raised with this this issue. But it, it also um, provides an opportunity for confidence building, I think, and also for states to demonstrate that they are. Um, uh, committed to, if you will, a level playing field in this, well, a level playing field in this proportionate movement to, to global zero, that they are willing to undertake serious talks about um, uh, say the sa securing of nuclear um, uh, fuels and, and uh, nuclear um, materials. Uh, so that, that's just one point I wanted to make, is that that is, um, I think, a critical um, uh, area of, of discussion both within all um, uh, of these organizations and, and, and um, deliberations concerning the, the, the phased, um, verifiable, and enforced movement towards, um, um, towards Global zero, and then very quickly, um, and I'll leave the Arab-Israeli in case you know you really want to get into that. Um, you mentioned the NPT review summit. President Obama is also holding a summit in the spring of, of next year. So global zero are going to is going to use um, 
uh, or uses moments like that to mobilize um, citizens and, 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 and activism um, around the world to, to try to um, have, an, have an impact on, on a, um, uh, uh, leaders who, who, who participate in um, 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 occasions like that. It's to support leaders um, to, to support the political will that already exists, that all, uh, in every country faces some resistance, and also to try to bring those leaders that have not committed yet um, on board as they see that, in fact, um, as we create a kind of um, uh, de, um, um, uh, you know, a, a, as we achieve a, a um, a way of taking the prestige and, and, and in, in fact creating a, a more universal taboo around um, nuclear weapons programs. Not a very good way of putting it, but... Yeah. Kate, do you want to add on sanctions in the black market? Well, I was going to add on some other things. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> All right, you can. <laughs> Um, but just, just on this question of um, the Middle East, I mean, you, you're probably aware that since the 1970s there have been repeated UN resolutions calling for the establishment of a nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East. That is absolutely essential and I think it's incumbent on all states to ensure and to support that process happening. I know there have been attempts at doing it, um, but they haven't been successful. And I, I believe very strongly that achieving that is fundamental to achieving a wider, successful peace process. But of course, you also know that repeatedly there have been UN resolutions over a long period of time calling for a two-state solution in the Middle East. And I think there is not going to be peace in the Middle East until there are two proper viable states, you know, for Israelis and for Palestinians. And I think the continued failure to facilitate a properly functioning independent Palestinian state is it's both immoral and tragic that that, and catastrophic that that is not being properly facilitated. And I think, again, Big states, great powers have a responsibility, a moral and political responsibility to ensure that that happens and then we will get peace in the Middle East, it will be possible to have the nuclear weapons free zone and so on. I think they are inextricably linked and the United States and other great powers need to address that properly. Um, on the MPT review conference I can tell you what CMD is in the middle of campaigning for, as kind of progress there. Uh, you may be aware that over the past few years there's been an increasing lobby for the achievement of a nuclear weapons convention like the Chemical and Biological Weapons Convention um, at, at the um, NPT prep comms over the last few years. This has again been raised. There's been a model nuclear weapons convention under discussion in the UN. There was a UN General Assembly vote where the vast majority of states voted in favour of a nuclear weapons convention, including three nuclear weapons states, all arguing that there should be immediate negotiations on a nuclear weapons convention. We are urging our government to support a nuclear weapons convention as a goal, a way of achieving the, nuclear, the abolition of nuclear weapons, and we're calling specifically on uh, David Miliband, who's the Foreign Secretary, who is responsible for the NPT issues. We're calling on him to make British support for a nuclear weapons convention explicit at the NPT review conference. And then finally, just to say something about the question about climate change and nuclear energy. Um, I think, yes, the, the link, the technology link between nuclear weapons and nuclear energy is absolutely clear. And again, it's a, it's a catastrophic link. And if you have the proliferation of nuclear power, you will have very likely the proliferation, proliferation of nuclear weapons. And it was very disappointing for us earlier in the year when Gordon Brown was, made a speech saying some very, very positive good things about wanting to get uh, abolition of nuclear weapons, but simultaneously said, and we're going to fund a new uh, body or something, I can't remember exactly what structure, which will encourage the development of nuclear power around the world. Well, that seemed to me to be absolutely contradictory. But I think it's just worth saying, because you, uh, the questioner was... Uh, thinking that nuclear power has a part in dealing with the issue of climate change. And I, CND does not agree with that for a, a, a range of reasons. Just to touch on very briefly, it's not contrary to popular thought. It's not emission-free if you take the whole process of the generation of nuclear energy. 
It's exceptionally expensive. There's a limited supply of uranium. It's not a kind of infinite uh, permanent supply. Um, as we know, it produces massive amounts of toxic nuclear waste, which is radioactive, fatally radioactive for generations, if not thousands of years in part and so on. And there is as yet no existing safe storage method for nuclear waste. So we're poisoning the planet. We can do it fast through some methods or slow through nuclear waste. So it's disastrous. In terms of being a solution to, power, to um, climate change, if you look at the situation in Britain, 4% of Britain's energy needs are met by our current nuclear power stations. They're all coming to the end of their shelf life. So to continue to produce 4% of our energy needs, we would have to rebuild all those. That's a minute fraction of what we need. It takes 12 years or so to get a nuclear power station on track in, in production. So even if you were prepared to overlook all those problems, which would be rash in my view, it's too little, too late to solve the problem of climate change. Much better to put all those extensive resources into renewables, into new technologies, maybe carbon capture, for example, all kinds of things, just even saving energy. So it's not the answer to climate change. You want, I yeah, know. I want to say a couple of things. First of all, I'm not going to debate Kate Hudson on nuclear power. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't care, uh, in terms of the, new, uh, the issue, reason we're here tonight to talk about nuclear weapons, and I don't care what Britain does with nuclear power. It's irrelevant. <laughs> But I don't want to take a kind of nanny state foreign policy and go to these countries and say, we don't want you to have, yes, we have nuclear weapons, we don't want you to have nuclear weapons, and oh, by the way, we don't think nuclear, civilian nuclear power is good for you either, so we're not, we don't want you to do that either. And whether you like it or not, this is part of the political trade-up that has been, uh, been what was integrated into the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty, so you just can't go to the Iranians and say, this is a stupid thing you're doing. You've told us you want to do this because for civilian or commercial reasons. Well, we we just don't first. disagree, yes. uh, <laughs> you know. Exactly. Well, you know, if you think the Iranians are going to base their decisions on what the British do, I mean, fine. But I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> they I'm just say, saying, they say we were behind all the be, protests. They be, think we're really important. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, you, you dine out on that. But, but, you know, honestly, honestly here, let's be realistic and let's, if, we, if we're serious about these problems, uh, let's, let's don't kind of lecture everybody about what we think is good and bad. And uh, the issue about uh, enrichment uh, facilities is a really trouble, a difficult issue because, of course, you'd like to have international enrichment facilities. But like the Iranians have already said, well, how do we know in a crisis or something, we do something you don't like, you're going to cut us off. Uh, let us enrich and we'll let you have inspectors come in. And we say, well, how do we know if we do something you don't like, you'll throw the inspectors out. So it's, it's, a, it's a tough problem. And, I'm not, and we, I don't think there is a solution. Black market group. This reminds me of... James Bond and Dr. No. Uh, there's some group out there that is somehow going to develop a, a nuclear weapons, and, and what are we going to do then? I think that is far-fetched. I mean, I think the problem is, is are these groups not, not a, being able to kind of quietly or secretly develop an, their own nuclear weapons? We will know about it. Nobody has ever developed a nuclear weapon without us finding out. We, there's, the industrial activities involved are, are enormously difficult. They're, they're, uh, they le all leave a major intelligence signal. So uh, I think that uh, I don't see that as a real threat. The, thr the threat is, the threat is uh, either very crude devices where they get a hold of some radioactive material and, 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 and blow it up and spread it through the air, or they steal it. They steal it, it's the loose nukes problem. Right. Somebody, uh, somebody uh, gets access to some nuclear weapons in, in Russia, Pakistan, whatever. That, that is the real threat. Uh, but I have to say that in the case of sub-state groups and uh, acquiring or coming close to acquiring a nuclear capability, then that's a situation where I favor a preemptive military action. 
I mean, there's no, there's no negotiating around that. I mean, there's, there's no other alternative open to you, but, uh, but taking military action. I mean, I don't, I don't, you're, you're not nuclear just, military. No, action. of course not. <laughs> just, just, just check it. You know, the problem is, the dir the dirty little secret is we don't need those nuclear weapons anymore. You know, these new generation, new family of conventional. Weapons are very good. And no, and, and very little collateral damage. Ooh. So, Man. I love the booze. Do you want to come back? Oh, uh, I would just like to say I think that, that, that um, you know, we come back over and over again to confidence building measures and, and um, and, and, and that we can all make those um, measures. And, and just as referred to with the Arab-Israeli conflict, um, uh, the, the NPT uh, could, could be, be um, a, a confidence-building measure if, if, um, if Israel does finally admit to its program and, and, um, uh, and sign up to, in a way that is not compromising um, its, its legitimate security uh, concerns to, to a process that um, with the rest of the community of, of nations. Um, because it is the double standards that so often undermine what otherwise might be a very successful um, a process. And all parties have to be held accountable, whether you're talking again about um, nuclear weapons or you're talking about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And that hasn't been the case, um, at least by the great powers. Um, so, but you have in place, as the NPT has been for this issue on, um, on, on nuclear weapons, you, you have in place framework agreements um, uh, such as the MPT, which has played a very important role, but that role now needs to be strengthened and expanded, and and, and um, there there needs to be a more um, consistent, balanced um, a process that that is viewed as fair and and not uh, um, discriminatory or exceptional in any way. And the same thing is true for the Arab-Israeli uh, conflict. There are. Um, there is the international framework of international law, UN Security Council resolutions, and there is um, uh, uh, there are a series of framework of, of agreements, treaties, framework agreements, and others that have been agreed to that have all been walked away from by the present Israeli government, or that are being walked away from by the present Israeli government as it proceeds to consistently change facts on the ground. Uh, not the first administration to do so. In fact, that has been cons a consistent um, uh, trend since 1967. So um, all parties have to be held accountable. All parties have to come to the table. And just as in the Northern Ireland peace process, um, if you include all parties in the process and you uh, create an environment in which everyone is talking together, um, a secure, neutral, respectful environment, you have the best possibility, I think, of coming to uh, a resolution, whether of um, the, the Arab-Israeli conflict, a, 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 a regional um, issue we've been discussing here, or um, uh, certainly um, where uh, the, the um, uh, movement towards global zero is, is concerned. Well, unfortunately, we seem to be coming to the end. I really wanted to get let other people have a chance to speak. I want to put one proposal on the table, and then I want to let each of our speakers say one thing they think is crucial, and then we'll come to an end. My one thing is that I think there's something really bizarre and anachronistic that we live in a world where now we put more and more emphasis on international humanitarian law and human rights law. We think genocide is unacceptable. We talk about war crimes. We have. Uh, conventions to ban landmines and cluster munitions, and yet we don't talk about nuclear weapons in the same way. And I think there needs to be that kind of sense of total unacceptability if we're to reach global zero. So my one suggestion of reaching that is when the International Criminal Court comes up for its review, 
we should try to include the idea that the use of nuclear weapons is a war crime. So that's my suggestion. Having put my little one pen in, I'd like to ask each of our speakers to say <coughs> one thing they think is really important, and I'll let... Oh, I realise. I hope you all could hear me, because now... <laughs> um, let's start with Kate. We'll go in the same order as before. OK, I'm going to be a bit naughty and just say three things, but all in one sentence. OK. <laughs> I think we should have um, an agreement by all nuclear weapon states to pledge no first use. I think they should uh, reaffirm the fact that they would never use any such thing against a state which didn't have them. And I think we should have um, a treaty, a nuclear weapons convention, completely outlawing nuclear weapons, so not just making their use illegal and a war crime, but making them illegal. I agree with that, too. <laughs> Ambassador Burke. Yeah, I just, I guess my one comment would be on this whole issue of how, uh, how difficult are the politics of this, and uh, why aren't more people engaged in trying to change or push for for uh, nuclear elimination. If I compare it with the sort of issue of our time, which is uh, global climate change, I, I think climate change is a really hard thing to achieve because think of who you are going up against. You're going up against very, very well-financed major oil companies. You're going up against uh, major utility companies. You're going up against uh, people's uh, habits of how profligate they are in using energy. You, I mean, you are really taking on one of the most difficult issues in terms of trying to assemble the necessary firepower to win this debate. When I look at the nuclear issue, to, uh, to use a famous word from the Iraq War, I mean, it's a it's a cakewalk. Uh, take a look at military establishments. One of the big changes in the American military establishment in the last 20, 25 years is you don't get to be a general anymore by uh, by commanding nuclear forces. It's becoming increasingly a marginalized military activity. The people who get the headlines and get the stars are counterinsurgency people. They're David Petraeus, they're General McChrystal. They're, the, the, they're dealing with the, the contemporary security problems as people define them. So the military, and you look at military budgets, the military doesn't view nuclear weapons in the same way as they did in the Cold War. You look at our nuclear establishment, the people who make those weapons and the labs that design them, they're, they're not politically influential. They have a little bit of power, but not a lot. So what I'm suggesting here is that, that there's such an asymmetry in terms of the opposition here that uh, well-organized uh, groups that are prepared to make the right arguments to, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to get their point of view across, I think, have a much higher opportunity for success on this issue than climate change. Well, thank you. And finally, I'd like to ask Queen Nuv to... So you're saying it's a slam last... dunk? Uh, <laughs> uh, either that or a cakewalk. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, would, I would like to see, um, and, and I'll, I'll try to be both realistic here, and, but, but I'll start out by being very idealistic, but I would like to see a delegitimization, if that's the right word, of um, the uh, industry of selling arms, uh, nuclear arms technologies, but also other <laughs> arms technologies um, to developing states, in particular in unstable regions uh, where so many of the problems we've discussed tonight um, um, are, are, are present, so many factors are present that, that makes that immoral, unethical, and 
against the interest of the states within which these industries operate uh, and, and, and produce their materials and, and in everybody, against everybody's interest. So I would like to see um, something m much broader, obviously, than, than, than what we're talking about. The, because the figures, as I said earlier, are, are, are shocking. Uh, the expenditures, uh, especially in, in our region of the world, the highest military expenditures, the least amount of, of security, and um, Ambassador Burt has reiterated over and over again, um, at least where nuclear weapons are concerned, that they are considered by the experts um, and, and those with long historical experience to, to really be outmoded, ineffective, and uh, just plain dumb, really. You didn't say that. I don't put any words in your mouth. And the other thing I'd like to say, which perhaps is a little more down to earth, is I would just like to reiterate how much we need you all, um, how much we need you to inform yourself. And I know we're competing with climate change. I know from, <laughs> no, 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 by the way, uh, <laughs> And I think that's good in the sense that, that um, in, the, in the period of leading up to Copenhagen, as I found out from you know, students at the United World Colleges, um, I'm president of this network of 13 colleges around the world um, uh, where students from 120 countries um, uh, study and live together and, and really are amongst the most passionate peace activists and, 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 um, and, and really understanding and realistic um, and, 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 and aware of so many of the complexities that, that we've just been uh, uh, vaguely alluding to today that are political, cultural, uh, economic, and, and, and otherwise. And they are, um, yes, very interested in, our, in, in, in Global Zero and will likely engage much more actively after Copenhagen because the climate change it has become, is the issue right now that they are putting an enormous amount of energy. And I think that is good. And I understand that that's the case for many of you as well. I would like <coughs> you to add to um, that, that very legitimate, um, urgent, um, security threat to our world, climate change, the more knowledge and understanding and activism where um, our goal to, to work for the elimination of nuclear weapons is concerned because the short answer is the more weapons, more weapons and weapons materials that are out there in the world that are available because we have not um, destroyed them because we have not reduced the arsenals of, of the nuclear states and begun to bring all those materials under control. The more that th there are out there, no matter where they are, the more we're in danger of an accident um, or, or of non-state actors um, getting their hands on them, as has already been um, discussed. So there really is no alternative except um, global zero. Please get involved. Get your families, your friends, your communities. Get this country. Get your neighboring countries. Get France and other <laughs> countries involved. Well, thank you all so much for three terrific presentations. And I thought we had a great discussion. I want to tell you that you can sign the global. There are petition. There are global zero statements outside, and you can add your name and get yourself on the mailing list. So do join. But thank you very, very much for all of you.